never underestimate the importance of inviting someone into your life, into your table, who needs to hear the good news of Jesus. Those tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes he ate with, they were the ones who were missing out. Jesus saw them. He saw they were missing out and he decided to dine with them anyway. Good morning, Gateway. How are we all this morning? Are you ready to play a game with me today? I see one hand, great. Are you ready to play a game with me this morning? Uh, one of my favorite things to do at the moment with my nephews is play the game Guess Who. Anyone play Guess Who recently? It's an old school game. It's making a bit of a comeback, actually. I am, um, when my, got married, funnily enough, my housemate, when I moved out, made me a custom Guess Who board, Guess Who board, with all my friends' faces in it, which was kind of fun. Um, I love that little gift that he gave me. But we're going to play a game today, all right? So the tech team's going to put one of these faces on the screen behind me. I'm not going to be able to see it. I don't know who it is. We're going to play a quick game of Guess Who. Is that all right? Know how to play? All right, here we go. Does the person on the screen behind me have uh, blue eyes? Okay, make sure you shout out in the chat as well. Type it in the chat. So this guy is gone, right? No blue eyes? See you, Johnny. He can be called Johnny. Uh, does the person I have have uh, glasses on? They do. Okay, so that means that Grandpa George and... This lady can just be called Denise, why not, why not? Denise, so bye Denise. Uh, does my person have a hat on? Okay, so it's not Althea, great. Uh, okay, this is the place where I get to guess. Now, I got it wrong at the eight o'clock. I'm gonna guess this, per is it this person for the 10 o'clock? Now that's the benefit of having two services in the day, right? <laughs> I can at least win one. So this is, this is Charlotte, that'll do. Charlotte wins today. Charlotte is the person on my Guess Who board. Um, I love Guess Who. This gives a bit of fun. There's a bit of a resurgence going on where you've got to guess the names of people, not based on their physical characteristics, but uh, their, what, they might look, what they might do. So does this person look like they'd be a pastor's kid? You have to put them down if you think that's true. It's a bit of fun. I love Guess Who. I love playing with my nephews. It's a simple, uncomplicated game. I love that when we look at the life of Jesus, he had a simple, uncomplicated policy which was an open table policy. Everyone around the table Jesus sat at was welcomed. We say every Sunday here, everyone is welcome. Uh, for Jesus, at his table, every single person was welcome. He would eat with his friends, the disciples. Think of the Last Supper. They would gather around a table, much like this, you've seen the paintings, I'm sure. Uh, his friends, before the night he was, on the night he was betrayed, he would gather with his friends and have a meal with them, the last meal they would share. He would gather all throughout his ministry with tax collectors, people who had betrayed the philosophy and religion of the day. That he would meet with and have dine with prostitutes, people who weren't worthy of sitting at the table. He'd eat and he would dine with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious people who would often tell him, stop eating with others. Doesn't matter where they came from, what their story was, what their background was, they were welcomed at Jesus' table. Jesus had an open table policy. I love that everyone is welcome at Jesus' table. One of my friends who lives down in uh, Bunjalung country, which is down at the Tweed, uh, down the coast, he says this. He, he believes that every person has got a desire for connection and community. And he says that you know that you're a friend of a First Nations person when your story is safe in their mouth. I love the beauty of that. When your story is safe with someone else, you know that you're a friend. And today, whether it's, we'll look at, whether it was a meal, uh, an intentional conversation Jesus had, whether it was a brush passed in the crowd, whoever met with Jesus, whether it was around the table or no matter where it was, they had all their needs met by Jesus and were invited into a new sense of community they may have never experienced before. I believe that the heart of every person is this need and desire for community. Uh, we know that every introvert in the room, even you, <laughs> have a desire in you, an inbuilt desire created as human beings by God that we have a desire and a deep need for community and connection that will not go away. And the Harvard study we've been referring to over the last few weeks tells us what we already know from thousands of years of biblical history. 
that the key to the good life is good relationships. How you find your people, your tribe, your family of choice is what we're looking at today because we've looked at the most intimate relationship, you and God, the intimate relationship with your spouses. We've looked at the relationships you have uh, with your families gathered around the kitchen table as Jason preached on last week. Today, how do you find the good life with your friends, the people you live, work, and laugh with? Jesus himself had varying levels of relationships uh, that he invested into and was, he, that he was the recipient of. And it's a good model for us to say how we can do the same today. It's how we find the good life that we, and the relationships we desperately long for. Firstly, in Jesus' life, we saw that he would interact with people everywhere all the time, everywhere all at once. This was a crowd. Jesus had a crowd. For Jesus, these are people who are open and receptive to his message. In Matthew chapter 13, we see a crowd so large gathering around Jesus that he has to get in a boat and step out a bit of the way into the water so that he can see and address the whole crowd. But the next chapter, we read this, Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus landed in the boat and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Even as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, then they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves and two fishes, the disciples said. Uh, Bring them here to me, Jesus said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And what happens next is one of the only stories that's mentioned in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. With this small little thing they gathered around, not a table, but on a grass paddock on the side of the lake, eating till their heart was content with abundance left over, baskets full left over. This story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is a beautiful example that there was a crowd of people who needed to know him. And he had, the the verse 14 tells us, he had compassion on them. It says that Jesus saw this random, assorted multitude of people, providing them with everything they've ever needed as they gathered around him. See, the crowd for us may not be 5,000 people standing in front of us when we get to address them. That may not be it. But the crowd for us today are the people we live with work and laugh with. And these people might be receptive to the faith you have and, or they might be people of peace as Jesus calls them or they might be indifferent or antagonistic towards faith. Re- regardless, these are the people in your everyday life. It's your colleagues, your friends, the people who you go to university with, the people on your online chat groups. These are the people who are the crowd that Jesus related to. You name it, you name a person, They're part of your crowd. And this is where, if you call yourself a Christian, that your discipleship gets real. The crowd is your mission field. And I say this, and what I say next, I say with the most love a pastor can give uh, to his congregation, but according to the great commission of Jesus to go and make disciples, you're not really a disciple of Jesus unless you're making other disciples. Now, I want to be clear. This isn't about your salvation. Salvation is a free gift of grace that Jesus gives to everyone who asks. Nothing we have to do for it other than say, Jesus, I'm yours. But if we choose then to take that salvation and do something with it, step out of the boat, so to speak, and begin to do something with our faith, we're only really a disciple of Jesus, apprenticed under him, following him, doing what he told us to do, if we are making other disciples. Disciples. I love coming to church on a Sunday. It's my favorite day of the week. Anyone else's? I love Sunday. We get to come here and we worship here. I love worshiping and singing our God. But our worship is incomplete if we're not discipling someone else or sharing our faith with or serving someone who doesn't yet know Jesus or the least of these. And likewise, I love hearing the word, opening the word of God. Uh, We do it here every Sunday. It's something we will do every Sunday. But in the same way, our theology, 
our understanding of God is incomplete unless we are sharing faith with the lost and spending our life on behalf of the poor. Sounds harsh. Each and every one of us can accept the invitation of a free gift of Jesus, but there is a call to every disciple to be a disciple who makes other disciples. That's what Jesus did, and it's the call for us to do it as well. This is what being a Christian is all about, mixing with the people in your crowd. It's not just passing them by on the way to get to the next Sunday. You've got a whole six days of the week where you rub shoulders with people in your school, workplace, the people you live, work, and laugh with. Don't just brush them off so you can get to the place where your real community is. The people you rub shoulders with are your mission field. It's the place you get the chance to be a disciple who makes a disciple that maybe, just maybe, someone else will hear, know, and understand the good news of Jesus the way you do and put their faith and trust in him and then they go and make another disciple. Then they go make another disciple. That's what being a Christian and a follower of Jesus is all about. But Jesus impacted people in a crowd. I wanna ask, who is in your crowd? Who can you identify today that is in the crowd of people in your life? you can connect with and minister to. But he didn't just have a big crowd. He had a smaller crowd as well. Jesus had a 72. I want you to look to your left. Do it. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look to the names in the chat who've already posted in the chat today. This is your 72. Now, don't get hung up on the number 72. There are clearly more than 72 people here in the room and online right now. But the 72 are the people who that you are on mission with. Luke chapter 10, verse one says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. Then he says, go, go out. When we gather as the people of God here on a Sunday, we are the 72. We are the people who are on mission. If you are a disciple of Jesus today, you have a mission. Each and every one of us does. The 72 to reach the crowd. That's our call as disciples of Jesus. Don't get caught up in the numbers. There's more than 72. But it's the people who are like-minded with you in their love of Christ that you can gather with, worship with, open the word with, pray together without fear, condemnation, or judgment. So if the crowd is your mission field, the 72 are the people you are on mission with. And gathering for just an hour and a half on a Sunday, well, it could be longer depending who's preaching, an hour and a half on a Sunday doesn't fulfill this deep longing for community and connection every human is hardwired to have. For an hour and a half, whether it's online or here, isn't gonna feel a weekly long need for community and connection. Community is a way of life. It's the thing that we do with one another. Christian community is the place where our highs are heightened and our lows are softened because we are on mission together. It's the place where we journey together to hear from the Holy Spirit about where he's calling us to go next. The Church of 72 is a place where if you are sick, people will spend time visiting you or bringing you chicken soup. It's the place where people will pray for you, notice if you're missing. It's a network of people who notice the space sitting beside you is empty who will call you and reach out to you during the week. It's a call of every single one of us. And do we do it perfectly? No, we don't. But there's an aspirational aspect of this. When we say everyone is welcome who comes to Gateway, we mean it. But we also have an aspirational hope of that, that each and every one of us would make that true together. It's not my job. It's not Susie's job as our connection coordinator. It's not Tim's job as our campus pastor. It's all of our jobs together to welcome everybody into the family of God and be on mission together. Therefore, it actually is Susie's job and it is Tim's job and it's my job because it's all of our jobs. We do this together. The way in which we do this is so important. Tim Chester, who's the author of a great book called A Meal with Jesus, is discovering grace, community and mission around the table. Fantastic book. He says this, Christian community demonstrates the effectiveness of the gospel. We are the living proof that the gospel is not an empty word, but a powerful word that makes men and women who are lovers of self and transforms them by grace through the Spirit 
into people who love God and love others. How we gather as church is so important. You may not be able to know every person sitting in the pews around you, but those to your left and right are the people you are on mission with. Jesus served with the 72. They went to the places ahead of him. He mingled with the crowd of people gathered around him, but beyond these people he served and sent out, Jesus had a close-knit group of friends that he did life with. Jesus had a 12. This was effectively Jesus' life group. It's impossible to know everyone's story in a church this size, so we need smaller groups of people uh, where our stories can be safe with each other. Uh, For us here at Gateway, uh, we have life groups and have had them for a long time as part of the story of our life, uh, our life of the church. Not because we think life groups are the best great idea and they're perfect, but because we see Jesus modeling what it means to be invested in a small group of people. I want to encourage you today, as you think about who's in your crowd, who are you serving alongside with, who are you meeting with around a table like this, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, who are your 12? Your small group of people who know your name and your story, who will, your story will be safe in their, in their mouth and in their hearts. For Jesus, these 12 were Simon, who also called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, not to be confused with the other James, Simon, not to be confused with Simon, who's now the Simon the Zealot, and Judas, well, Judas number one, who's now also called Thaddeus, because you don't want to be known as Judas for the rest of your life because Judas is the guy who betrayed Jesus, right? There's 12 guys, complex story, complex names. Read it a few times, you'll get the names in your head eventually. But he had 12, 12 people he chose out of a broader group of people of the 72 to say, you're my guys. I'm gonna invite you into my life. I'm gonna spend my time doing life intentionally with you. And these 12 got to see and do things that the 72 wouldn't together. It's important. I know that in my life group, I'm in, I'm in a life group. These are the people who I know have my back when I'm going through the fight of my life. The people who will send me a random text message or visit me out of the blue to encourage my weary spirit. These are the people who, like Jesus, couldn't experience that type of care in the 72. We needed the, we need the 12 and Jesus modeled it for us. It's a place where we can see miraculous things happen together through prayer and petition with God, where we can be open and reveal what God is doing around a table like this. There are places of incredible encouragement, places of incredible teaching, places of accountability and challenge as well. There are places of deep care and deep support, pastoral support. And Mercy and I would be lost without our life group. And I dare say our life group would be lost without us. But we do this because we know the importance of gathering in a group. We also know the importance of leading a group. We have the pleasure of leading a young adult's life group. Young people who are coming to know Jesus more and more, we get to share life with them. And in the same way Jesus modeled his life for his disciples, we get to model our life for them. We love that we get to be in a group and we get to lead a group. We need this because Jesus did it. Not because we're Bible experts and it's an ego trip, but because we take seriously the great commission of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations and opening up our living room and our dining table to people every week, every fortnight. In John chapter 13, we see one of the most important meals in scripture. It's the Passover feast just before Jesus is betrayed. Chapter 13, uh, verse one, uh, says this. It was just before the Passover festival Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were, in, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, I'm gonna pause for a second. I've read these verses hundreds of times. This verse stood out to me like nothing else. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse two, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he came from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, 
And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him, skipping down to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for it is what I am. Now that I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus sets the example what it means to love and serve one another. And he begins with the 12 here. He begins with the 12 people. But he does it saying he's gonna love them to the end. This group was not perfect. Jesus betrayed him. That's the obvious one. We know that happens. <laughs> Wouldn't wanna hang around with Judas very much knowing that was gonna happen. But Peter would deny him three times that very night, right after they'd gathered around the table. Thomas, a few days later, would doubt his resurrection. We know that Peter, that James and John had a fight amongst the disciples and with Jesus right there saying, one of us is gonna be the best sitting at your right hand, Jesus. That's a pretty jerk thing to say around a gathered table. These guys weren't particularly good. They weren't a perfect group of people. And that's encouragement for me because my life, got, my life group's not perfect. Why? Because I'm in it. Because I know that I have the propensity to be unkind, put my foot in it, as do everyone else who gathers around our life group table. It's the nature of being a fallen person. But if Jesus was willing to gather with those people anyway, knowing they were gonna fail him and fall away, how much more should we do the same? To gather with people who are broken, being remade in the image of their saviour, Jesus. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. I wanna love my life group to the end, warts and all. Jesus trusted these 12. He did life with them. Even though they didn't all have his back, Jesus knew the importance of 12 people, a small group to gather with. I wanna ask you, who's your 12? Or maybe you've got a 12 and you've been a bit flaky this last little while. Maybe during COVID you gave up on your life group. They're still meeting, but you're not there. There is something profoundly important that Jesus shows us about gathering at a table or a dining room or a lounge room with about 12 people to do life intentionally with. Who are your 12? Henry Nouwen says this, that underneath a successful and highly praised career can live a fearful person who doesn't think much of himself or herself. In community, comes the mutual vulnerability in which we forgive each other and celebrate each other's gifts. We need a place for this. And we can do that in our life groups, a place where we have each other's backs. But Jesus also had a three. Three people he chose out of that 12 that he would share the most important and intimate inmost parts of his world. In Matthew 17, it says this, he took, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from within the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. These three guys were invited into something special, something that the crowd, the 72, and even the 12 weren't able to experience. These three guys were the guys Jesus knew would stand with him as witnesses to his transfiguration, him becoming the glory of God in human flesh. In that moment, these three guys saw Jesus for who he really was. Something the other disciples would get a little later on. But it's also though these three who are with Jesus in 
Jesus' most difficult moments. They're chosen and drawn out. After the, the, the meal with the 12, Jesus goes to pray in the garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 36 says, when Jesus sent his disciples to Gethsemane and he called to them, he said, sit here a while while I go over there to pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrow and troubled, sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus was facing the moment we had a choice before him to be obedient to death and death on the cross or to say, God, take this cup from me. And those three guys were invited to pray with him in that moment. Now, yes, they fell asleep. I'm a sleepy guy, I get it. But he still chose them knowing they would fall asleep because he needed them around him for the highs, the highest of highs on the mountaintop and the lowest of lows in the garden. Jesus needed those three to gather around him. I tell you what, having people like this who will drop everything for you, who you know in the moment of your deepest, darkest valley will go, hey, Brad, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing and come and call you, visit you, meet you, do things for you that you need. Having your three is so important but it also means that you need to be the three for someone else. To love, to care for, to notice, to serve them with sacrificial agape kind of love that Jason was talking about last week. We need to have people in our crowd, in our 72, in our 12, and in our three. We need to have people in all of these spheres of life. Who is in your crowd? Think of one person just right now that you just live, work, and laugh with. You go about your week in. Is there someone there you can intentionally come alongside? What about the 72? Someone in here that you're on mission with? Maybe you've been coming to church for a while and you've been sitting in these beautiful, comfy pews. You've been joining us online. Maybe the prompting of the Spirit today is, these are the people I get to be on mission with. How am I gonna serve here today? How am I gonna serve the people of God and the people in our community? Maybe you'll find a way to join one of our teams as part of Team Gateway. As you gather today, you're thinking, oh, maybe I just need to connect, reconnect with my life group. Who's your 12? And who are your three? The three who will be there for you till the very bitter end. We need those people in our spheres. But if we are disciples of Jesus, we also have to be those people for others. How do we do that? How do we gather alongside a crowd, the 72? Who are the the 12 people we, we choose to serve? Who are the three people we choose to serve and love and care for? One of the best ways we can figure this out is actually gathering around a table that's like set up here today. Before almost every good thing that happens in Scripture, you can read this through the Old Testament, through a whole bunch of festivals. They all began with feasts. Before the Day of Atonement, before you had to forgive those around you and seek forgiveness from God, there was a festival and a feast. People have always gathered around the table of God to celebrate what he's doing. It's been a meal that was shared in different ways to help us connect with the hunger that's in our bodies, with the hunger and need for God and community. One of the ways you can do it is gathering around a table. Acts chapter two, and Susie's already mentioned this today. I love that it's her heart. Makes perfect sense for our connection coordinator, doesn't it? That that this Acts chapter two picture of the church is what we wanna picture here at Gateway and Beyond. Says this, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day, not just on Sundays once a week, every day they gathered together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
Communities and connection is not just something that happens on a Sunday. It is something we are hardwired for every day of the week. We need to be connecting with those we live, work, and laugh with. Never underestimate the power of gathering people, whether they might be old grandpas we know really well, or whether it's strangers we've never met, whether it's people we've got a fledging relationship with, or whether it's people who we've got a long relationship with we might not have seen in a while. When we gather people around our table and their story is safe in our mouth and story is safe in our hearts, incredible things happen. Incredible things happen, miraculous things happen. But the simple and mundane happens as well. We find our needs met, our longing for connection and community met. And I wanna ask today, what is perhaps the most powerful question a Christian can ask about anything? Who is missing out? Who is missing from your table? When we ask the question, who is missing out? It forces us to see those around us with the eyes of Jesus. Jesus had an open table policy. Who is missing or excluded from our table because we deem them not good enough or they're just not part of our circle? It's a challenging question for each and every one of us. Who is missing out? And if we can ask that question, I believe God will do miraculous things around our tables with people we wouldn't normally eat with. Underestimate the importance of inviting someone into your life, into your table, who needs to hear the good news of Jesus. Matthew chapter nine, verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and the disciples. When the Pharisees, read religious folk, saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. Those tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes he ate with, they were the ones who were missing out. Jesus saw them. He saw they were missing out and he decided to dine with them anyway. Who is missing out? Who is missing out on the good things of God right here today? When we ask the question, who misses out? It makes my heart sing because it means we also live out our gateway value that we value the ones. There are people all across our church family who epitomize this by in being invited to the table or inviting others to the table. Well, I honored a lady called Nadia this morning. She sits over here in the eight o'clock service. Nadia has only been coming to Gateway for about 12 months or so now, and she's been having conversation with me about people who are missing out. See, Nadia is Chinese, and she says to me day in, day out, bro, there are people who, who are from China in our Asian countries right across our services, all across Gateway. And she's been one of our alpha leaders this year, has been an incredible host and gift to her in that space. But she has noticed that there is a need for uh, there to be an Asian-speaking alpha next year. So term one next year, we're gonna run our first ever Chinese-speaking alpha simply because Nadia noticed who was missing out. If, you, if that might be something you wanna resonate with today, you think, oh, I'd love to be involved with that, come and see me after the service. Nadia would be, would be a great person to pioneer that forward simply because she asked the question, who is missing out? I don't know if he's in the room right now, but Ron Grant, is he in here? He was at eight o'clock service. He's actually up in the loft getting stuff sorted up there right now because he has noticed that there are a band of bikers who don't know Jesus yet. He's invited them to a MotoGP event up in the loft today. Free sausage sizzle, go watch the MotoGP on the big screen. This is like fun. But he's in, he saw a need, he saw who's missing out. And he's gonna invite them to Alpha next term. There are people all across our church family and online if you are online at all, you know Graham and Mel Carl. They've been online as welcome leaders since pretty much day dot. But Graham, they have this passion to invite people from all from Gundawindi, where they, where they live, into their own home. They notice who's missing out and they literally invite them to their dining room table 
to sit, eat, share a meal, to hear the good news of Jesus because they care about that community and they've noticed the ones who are missing out. Friends, if we're disciples of Jesus, this is the question for us. Who's missing out? Who is missing out on hearing the good news of Jesus around our tables? Who can you invite to your table? How do we respond to this? I think there's two things we can do. We can extend an invitation or we can accept an invitation. Sometimes we have to be comfortable being the initiator of giving, extending an invitation. There are, it hurts my heart when people sit in the pews here on a Sunday and feel like they're not connected. There are also people who sit here who sit in the pews like this during Say Good Day going, no one's gonna come and say hi to me. This church isn't welcoming or connecting. If that's you, I apologise. But maybe the Spirit's asking us to open up our hands and extend an invitation. Hey, I'm new here, yet I haven't found connection. What's your name? My name's Brad. Maybe it requires us, if we are seeking some connection, to be courageous and faithful and reach out a hand and ask, hey, I wanna be connected. Can you help me? Do you wanna have a coffee after the service in a wonderful Beyond Cafe? Do you wanna connect up so I can have someone that I can chat to? Maybe you see someone in the pew next to you who you've never met before. Extend an invitation. Let's have a coffee. Let's get to know each other. Know their story so it becomes safe inside the other church person's heart. We can't just sit waiting for community to come to us. Like I said before, it's not my job, Tim's job, Susie's job, Lauren's job, anyone's job who's on staff. It kind of is our job, but it is all of our job to welcome people in. We say everyone is welcome. We have to mean that. We have to live it and invite people in. You can extend an invitation to make someone feel welcome to connected right now. But you can also accept an invitation as well. If you are new today, newcomers are on straight after the service. Take the invitation. Don't just go home. Come and meet some other new people. Hear the stories of what God is doing here among our church. There's 72 people, more than 72. Maybe you can do what Tim's already shared today and sign up for Open Table. I um, wasn't called Open Table, it was called Dinners of Eight for me. I had left Ipswich, a place where I was super well connected. New people across the whole city, whole town. I don't wanna brag a bit, but I was the Ipswich 150 ambassador. 150 people chosen to kind of know all about Ipswich. I was one of those guys. And I left, followed the call of God, landed in a little tiny church in Sherwood, not in Ipswich anymore. I didn't know anyone. There was no one my own age. I was at a church being a kids and youth pastor, ministering to kids, loving it. It was great fun. But I had no connection until dinners of eight came up. And I accepted an invitation to a person's house, a couple, Anne and Alistair. They had their son called Bruce, young fella. I accepted an invitation with them and a few others. And I found a deep connection I didn't even know that I needed, that I was missing with them. There was no one my own age, sure but I've got a lifelong connection and friendship with that church community and those people because they opened their home. They saw that I was missing out. You can accept an invitation to join our Open Table initiative. Find a place to go and belong to someone's table, but you can also sign up to, to host a table. You've got the gift of hospitality. This is your, your moment, your call. Jesus had a crowd, he had 72, he had 12, and he had three. And maybe me sharing this today has made you feel, right, I don't think I've got any of that. I'm in desperate need of some connection and care. The good news is that Jesus modeled one more thing for us too, that Jesus had a one. He had a Father in heaven who knew him, who called him, who loved him. And even him with Jesus kneeling in the garden, asking God, please don't let me go through what I have to go through next. The father loved him. And because of that love, Jesus could see it through. If you feel like you are on your own today, we are loved by Jesus, the one who was abandoned in that garden, left to die on the cross on his own, and he had no one but his one. 
Jesus is your one today. I wonder if you don't know the grace and love of Jesus like that today. You can accept an invitation right here, right now, to take the invitation that Jesus offers everyone, everywhere, all the time, that you are welcome at his table, that you are welcomed into the family of God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So right now, I wanna invite us, just close your eyes, bow your heads. Today, if you wanna accept this invitation from Jesus to his table where everyone is welcomed for the first time, you feel like you have a hole that is missing, not just for community, but this this need for someone to know you and, and see you, Jesus does hanging on that cross pierced by those nails, he was thinking of you and I. Today, if you wanna accept the free gift of invitation and salvation that belongs to Jesus, I wanna invite you just with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you, just to lift your head, open your eyes and lift your hand so I can see you. I see that hand. If you're online today, if you wanna accept this free invitation, Press the button in the chat. The team would love to stand with you in prayer and pray with you. But if this is you, just lift your head, lift your eyes, raise your hand today. For those who have responded in here and online, I'm just gonna pray. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, today we thank you that we are welcomed at your table. We will never be turned away or shunned from the door from your table. And today, God, we pray that you'd forgive us for our sins, knowing that you're a God who sees us and loves us and offers forgiveness freely because of all you've done on the cross for us. We say thank you that you love us and you know us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you had made that decision today, let the chat know, let us know here today. We'd love to help you take your next steps. But I wonder if the rest of us, we could stand on our feet. Because there's a question that lingers. Who is missing out? Who is missing out from your table? Can you extend an invitation? Can you accept an invitation from someone today? Be thinking about who's in your crowd, who's in your 72, who's in your 12, who's in your three? And how can you be in, invite them to the table of God? where you all might experience the love and grace of Jesus together. Ask that question as we worship and sing. Let's sing.
of all of it. And my prayer is that we will witness your faithfulness again and again and again. And there'll be more and more stories that we will live to tell when we gather around your table together as God's people, inviting those who are missing out. So God, my prayer is that we would leave this place today, not dejected by a need for community, but inspired to reach a world in need and encourage those around us that we might have a beautiful, fruitful, faithful community of God here at Gateway Baptist Church that is a light to the nations, that proves the gospel is true by the way we live, work and laugh with those around us. We thank you, Lord. Pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Our prayer team will gather down the front at the end of the service if we would like prayer. We do it every week. But other than that, have a great coffee in the cafe, meet with people this week and be thinking about who's one person in each of those spheres you can spend time with being the good news of Jesus. Bless you. See you next week. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. We're a growing family and if you'd like to discover more about where we meet in all our locations and online, visit gatewaybaptist.com.au.